Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, thank you. We have just a wonderful crowd from everywhere. And I ended up getting some big potatoes from Maine. <laughs> so all of you who have never been to Maine, let me tell you, they got potatoes that big. <laughs> and so they have a lobster, but I wouldn't know what to do with a lobster. And if my sisters ever saw me putting a lobster in hot water, they would die on the spot. <laughs> because they're truly Franciscan and love animals, all kinds of things that crawl and, especially the things they eat at the table where you put a newspaper on the table. You know, you can't put a tablecloth because it would just rot. <laughs> and then they, they get these crawly things, you know, and they start chewing them and <laughs> on like that. And, and the odor is so bad. <laughs> Did you notice that? Do you do that too? No? You're beyond that. But you know, a sister said to me, why don't you taste them? And I said, oh, the odor is so bad. No, they're sweet. So I did, they were very sweet. So I, I can't relate the odor with the sweetness, you know, it must be really bad stuff. But they eat them, they sit there for an hour. One of the sisters says, I like the head. I said, the head? <laughs> what do you do with the head? She said, you suck them. I said, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. But anyway, all my Louisiana family and friends, I have nothing against Louisianians, you understand. It's just your type of food. I know. But we have about six or seven sisters who sit at the end of the table as far away as possible and eat these things on newspapers as long as I let them sit there. And, and uh, I think it's wonderful that you have such mortified people in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> I guess you got to get brought up with that stuff, you know, if you're, and they're such ugly looking things, you know. You, of course, a cow smells kind of bad too sometimes. But, <laughs> I read a, I read a, a, a list of, um, of uh, statements made by lawyers. I wish I'd have brought them here. They were so funny. But this one, this, and this one was an explanation to an insurance company of how this man had an accident. I don't know if I can remember it correctly, but I laughed so hard because he said, a car was coming towards me and I tried hard to duck him and I swayed from side to side and I finally hit him. <laughs> I 
And then he said, and my car veered off the road in a ditch, and I found myself next to a stinking cow. <laughs> I thought, what an explanation of an accident. But today I wanted to really speak to you about gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because most of us don't know the Holy Spirit. And I, th I think the reason is, is because it's hard to us to relate to a dove. See, the dove is a symbol of the love between the Father and the Son. And how else could you possibly symbolize love? Poets have written about it. Books have been written about it. People try to explain it. But you can't. In fact, you wonder sometimes how this person loves that person. Don't you? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem to go together. Sometimes you'll see this handsome man or this beautiful woman, and when you see their mate, <laughs> you wonder if they had dark glasses on. <laughs> you know, something happened there that uh, and you don't understand it because it just don't seem to go together. Hmm? So it's very difficult. To, to explain love, it's, it's impossible almost. But we know for sure, you see, that the Father created you and me. He created me, breathed a soul. At my conception and your conception, he breathed a soul into me. Small, tiny, went and there I was, wow. That's why abortions are so bad, see. Any of you out there thinking of one tonight, please don't. Because the breath of God was there, even under difficult circumstances. Uh, I breathe the soul, see. Now Jesus redeemed us because we just have all the consequences of original sin. You say, I don't have any. <laughs> I got news for you. You got a lot of them. I remember, I think I told you not, not too long ago, but this woman came with two uh, twins, and they both had all day suckers. And uh, one went, one lick, <laughs> and the other one put it behind him. He didn't want me to lick anything. <laughs> now, these two little boys were born at the same time, and they were twins, looked alike. One was very generous, the other mm, were born that way, you see. Some of us have tempers, some of us are impatient, some of us are greedy, some, a lot of things, angry, all kinds, and we're born with it, but the gifts of the Spirit help us overcome. Mm? See, so the Spirit is what we call the sanctifier. Our Lord said, when I leave, I will send you an advocate, someone who intercedes for us, but someone who has gifts for us. And the Lord, uh, in, the, in the second, uh, the fifth chapter of Galatians, St. Paul says, the Spirit brings something very different. He brings love. Mm. A lot of people write, even ask on the air, how do I know I love God? Well, you know you love God when you love God. When you don't want to commit sin. When you love your neighbor. So love is the first gift, then joy. Joy is different than happiness. You know, we had, we had so much work to do just to eat and get the coffee and and, and put the put the coal in the furnace. You know, now you just put your thermostat up. And I, th I think we've lost the fun out of life. You go down and shovel in that furnace of coal and you come up, it takes a while to get it heated. And 
But then you could sit down in that little chill and have a nice hot cup of strong coffee. <laughs> My grandma used to have a big tub and she put a ringer on it, you know, attached it to the tub. She had two tubs and, and a big washboard. And my fingers are still kind of numb from the. <laughs> and I'd be on one side, and we were washing these clothes with soap, and then you rinse them, and then you stick them through this thing. And the one we had was an electric, so Grandma would put them through, and, and I'd wring them, and all the water come down. And then you went outside and hung them up. Now we just open a door, push a button, clunk. If you're not careful, they come out about four inches shorter. <laughs> then you put them in. And the funny thing is now you can buy clothes so wrinkled, you don't need to put them through a ringer. <laughs> Somebody else does it for you. See? And they charge you a lot of money to buy a wrinkled dress or coat or it's all wrinkled, and if you buy these blue jeans that are faded, and they fade them for you too, <laughs> or got little fringes on the other like you wore them for 10 years, <laughs> you pay $60 for those stupid looking things, see? I could do it free for you on a rear. <laughs> Patience, patience. And so we don't have peace. And we're very impatient. I know, because I'm impatient too. We love cars, but we don't like red lights. <laughs> we know they're a gift, because you'd get killed if you went through a red light, but we don't like them. And sometimes, by golly, you get every single one. If you're in a hurry to go to a dentist or you miss your appointment, I'll bet you stop at every single red light. <laughs> and that's aggravating. I bet it wouldn't be aggravating if you had to take one of those, those smelly uh, horse carts or whatever they used to have. <laughs> or an old trolley. You'd have patience. Why? Because you're going to I know that my, my grandma and I one time went to Akron, Ohio. Now some of you, oh, you're from Ohio. Akron, Ohio, what is it, 30 miles from Canton? We took a lunch. We took a lunch, because it took us a long time to get there. And I was excited. It was like a picnic. But now you go 20 miles. You get there before you can spit out the window. <laughs> oh dear. Now there's such a thing as kindness. Kindness. See, we don't have time to be kind to each other. We don't. We're always out of breath. I told you not too long ago about how I saw this woman with a computer on this side, a cigarette in this hand, and she's eating. It's fascinating. I almost didn't eat my dinner. Because I was trying to figure out what she's going to do next. But it was like a, it was like a something she practiced. Puff. Food. Puff. Food. <laughs> I was fascinated. I, I, she never missed, never missed the trick. You know, it was like she practiced it. I would never have gone up to her and say, "I beg your pardon," because um, she would have been furious. She, I would have interrupted the, the puff, the food. <laughs> and the computer. Now we call that living today. See, and we call that girl very smart and very busy. 
and people would admire some woman, you know, a career, a real career. But I don't think she knows she puffed, and I knew she couldn't taste her food. <laughs> and she paid a lot for it. Because her mind and heart were on the computer. I was supposing she was going to take a drink next just to calm her nerves down, but she did. Thank God for that. Now, goodness is another virtue that we, we have rather forgotten. See, because we're so filled up with ourselves and our own pleasures and, and with gadgets, lots and lots of gadgets. They, you go in a car, you want a gasoline, you push a little button and the, the little gas thing goes click. Now you could put the gasoline in. You don't even have to open it and take it off. Everything is a gadget. So we, we don't have time for good because we don't see good things to do for my neighbor. See? We don't. Oh, if somebody dies, we'll bring him some spaghetti or a cake. But, you know, death isn't always a party. And I know the reason we do this is because they don't have time to cook and they don't feel like eating, and it's a, a good thing to do. But after that person's buried, do you ever bring them a cake? Do you say, hey, I had some good spaghetti left over, would you like it? See, goodness is something that we don't have time for that. That's why, if something this is a man-made thing, see. There are billions and billions of these chips and everything, and so we're 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 accustomed to living like that. And and most of you, unlike myself, have never. Many of these people have lived in those good old coffee pot days, <laughs> boiled coffee pot. And my grandma would never wash it. She'd say, oh, you spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> they take all, did you, ever, did you ever do that? Some of you oldsters, huh? No? You don't want to say you're an oldster? Um, I, I went to wash it one time and cleaned it up real sparkling. And she, oh, God, I thought she was going to beat me up. <laughs> but, but see, I'm not saying your coffee's bad. I'm saying we make it too quick, too quick. We're, we're always in a hurry. And that means I don't have time for my neighbor, and most of the time I don't have time for myself, really. How many of you have really can sit down, unless you're 94, and, and, and just relax and pray, or just sit there and talk to God or talk to your neighbor? We don't have time. We don't have time. And so I, I want you to be careful. I want you to look at these. Do we have these gifts? Do we want these gifts? Do, do we want them? Do we even know they exist? These, these are fruits of the Spirit. Trustfulness. Who do you trust? I'd like to know who you trust. Some of you have been hurt by your family, by your children. You don't trust them anymore. Some of you have been disappointed and hurt by your dearest friends. You don't trust them anymore. You buy a new car. By the time you drive it around this block, you've lost $1,000. $1,000 for driving it around the block. Take it back and try to exchange it. I'll tell you what you get. <laughs> so who do you trust today? Tell me. You know, there's a great shortage of, um, what do you call that? You don't know? Julia? Sheetrock, there it is. It's a great, you can't hardly buy sheetrock. Can't even find it. Yeah, why is there a shortage of sheetrock? Some brick is a shortage of brick. Today a man told me a hardware store is a shortage of some kind of wire. 
Why? I don't know why. Seems dumb to me. If you need, need more, why don't you make it? But they're not. I don't know why you should have a shortage. I heard about 25 different reasons. So we're so bound up, everybody, into things, things, the games, and uh, you know, I asked a nun one time, a sister or whatever. <laughs> I'm really not sure. If she was teaching her sisters, her kids about the Trinity, she said, goodness, no. She said, that's too deep. Really? Well, have you looked at the cartoons and the movies where these ugly, ugly creatures are watched for hours at a time? They're diabolical looking. And your kids are watching them from six years old, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. And these shirts they wear with these monsters that come from God knows where. You don't think that's too much? You think the Trinity is too much and this is fine? When 8, 9, 10, 12, 13 year old join satanic groups, are you thinking for a moment that that's light stuff? You can't be. How, how are we ever going to obtain these fruits here? And the seven gifts of the Spirit when we're so wound up in all this foolishness. Gentleness, oh boy. The violence today on TV is unbelievable. And your kids watch them. And what? Self-control. Self-control, oh, what's that? I'm going to try every Tuesday now for seven Tuesdays. And maybe you take a piece of paper and you begin to write down these gifts. The first one we're going to look at tonight is called Fear of the Lord. You're not going to like that one. You say, I don't want to fear God. That isn't what it means at all. Fear of the Lord means, let me give you an example. A mother baked a big batch of cookies. And she says to her little son, now don't touch these cookies because you're going to lose your appetite and we're going to have supper in a half hour. But he can smell those cookies, you know. And so he goes up real quiet and he lifts up the jar. And there's two things he can do. He can take a cookie and say, I don't care if Mama's mad or not. Mm. Not too good. It means he doesn't have any good fear of offending his mother. Or he can lift it up and take a cookie and even smell it and then say, no, she'll be real hurt if I do this. Puts the cookie back, puts the jar on top, and waits for supper. That's the gift of the fear of the Lord. It means I love God so much, I don't want to hurt him, let alone myself. He tells me not to do this, and I do it anyway. That's one gift. It gives me a horror of sin. And see, today we don't have a horror of sin. That's life. That's what they say. You're human. God made you that way. The cure of ours in France. And I told you this before, but it's, I think, in order tonight. This great, famous actress came in a carriage, and all the people in the city were there to see her, like you would any celebrity, whatever that means. And the curé came to, to meet her, and suddenly he stepped back. He said, Madame, I'm sorry. But the stench of your soul is so great, I must vomit. 
where she went off in a huff and a puff. But she should have listened. Because he was so holy and he was so much like God that he could smell that woman's soul was so bad. Famous in the world, but not before God. So he had what we would call a horror of sin. We don't have that today. Yeah. We contradict God. And we say, no, that's not a sin. God made you that way. You know what St. John says in his epistle? He said, if you say you have no sin, you call God a liar. Oh, you call God a liar. If God says fornication is a sin, adultery is a sin, and you say, no, it's not, then you call God a liar. You can't do that. And that's why you need, the whole world needs this gift of fear of the Lord. The next thing is a filial relationship with God as my father. He is my father. And I realize that because I only saw my father seven times. Thank God the last time he was sorry and he even cried a little bit. But I don't have a concept of father. I really don't. I never will. If you've only seen your father seven times, you don't have a reality of a father. But I have a reality for God is my father. A real reality. He is my father. He breathed a soul into me. He gave me his son to redeem me. Gave me his spirit to make me holy. He's a real father to me. I don't want to hurt him. And the other one is hope. Hope. And what it does is keep you and I from presumption. A lot of that today, isn't there, huh? Well, we can have an affair tonight. God understands. No, he doesn't understand. And you turn all the lights out, he still sees you. <laughs> I mean, don't be caught up in the big lie. You're not hiding it. You can't hide from God. <laughs> mm. So you see, we, we don't care. We, we, we don't care because I don't want to hurt God. I not want to presume I can depend upon his mercy. You can't go out, have an affair, have a good time, get drunk, come down the, 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 the highway to 120 and presume, <laughs> presume that if you got killed, you would go straight to heaven. I can tell you where we're going straight to. <laughs> Gehenna. Because you're not ready. You didn't love God at all. You only loved yourself. It's presumption. It's presumption. To think for a moment that you can do what you please. To God and come off smelling like a rose. You're going to smell, sweetheart, but it's not like a rose. <laughs> More like sulfur. <laughs> I went to the hardware store looking for something to get rid of snakes. And the guy brought me up a big bag of sulfur. Oh, Supposed to get rid of me or the snakes? <laughs> well, he said it keeps them away. I well, no wonder, you know. No wonder. It must be any way you know. Anybody knows that nice, calm way of getting rid of snakes? Let me know. Just don't send me sulfur. 
But you see, we, we don't know anymore. Nobody is telling me that I have to have the fear of the Lord. I have to know for sure that God is my Father. I know that he may punish me if I'm not what I should be, and I deserve it. You and I have to admit tonight, my friends, my family, whatever God hands out to us in these coming years, we deserve it. Don't complain. That millions of babies are torn asunder. We deserve it. That our children are caught up in everything, sex, lust, alcohol, drugs. You say, well, they're not all that way. I know, and I thank God for that. But you have to admit, they have no reality of the fear of the Lord. They don't know that God is Father. And because he's Father, we can't offend him. You don't offend your father. I'm going to just read you what Scripture says from Ecclesiastes. The fear of the Lord is glory and pride and happiness and a crown of joy. The fear of the Lord will gladden the heart, giving happiness and long life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. She was created within the faithful in her mother's womb. To fear the Lord is the perfection of wisdom. To fear the Lord is the crown of wisdom and makes peace and health flourish. To fear the Lord is the root of wisdom and her branches are long life. You can read that by Ecclesiastes, the first chapter 11 to the 25th verse. Next week, we're gonna take another gift we've lost in the years piety. We have a call. Hello? Hello. And where are you from? Oh, hi, Mother. This is Sandy from New Jersey. Oh, wonderful. What's your question? Well, Mother, um, it's about facing Jesus. Uh -huh. After 30 years of absence and then hearing you, I went to confession and came back to the Lord. Wonderful. Uh, but the more, the Blessed Trinity is everything to me. I live every day to serve Him and to love God, but I am afraid why? I'm afraid. I know he loves me, but as you said one time, what does he think of me? And I told, I've been telling Jesus, I'm afraid to face him because of my sins, my failures, oh, and my weaknesses. No, so you don't. please help me. Thank you. That's the wrong kind of fear, honey. That's what we call servile fear. It's a, it's a fear fear. See? You know, Angelo Feligno, one of my favorite saints, had some fears. And the Lord said to her, why do you fear? The past is dead. And the future, unborn. I'll repeat that. The past is dead. And the future is unborn. That's what you want to think about. No matter what sins you had in the past. I told you a couple of weeks ago about my experience at the ocean. When a drop of that ocean hit my hand and it was so beautiful, I just threw it back. And the Lord said to me, Angelica, do you see that drop? I said, yes, Lord. You see the ocean? I said, yes, Lord. He said, well, that drop are all your sins and weaknesses. And the ocean is my mercy. If you look for that drop, would you find it? I said, no, Lord. If you looked and looked, would you find it? I said, no, Lord. 